I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is where we're going to be today as we continue our Just Jesus series. We're uh, walking through the Gospel of Luke. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. They look like this. Turn to page 1022 and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. If, uh, if you don't have a Bible and you want to read God's Word, then take one of these with you. It's our gift to you. We just want you to, uh, to have God's Word because we know if you read it, it will change your life. Hey, while you're uh, finding Luke chapter 4, let me tell you about some uh, uh, good news, uh, a way that God has blessed us, and a challenge that kind of comes out of it for me that I wanted to pass on to you guys. Uh, this, uh, just recently, uh, Calvary was blessed with a gift of more than $200,000 uh, by someone. A isn't that awesome? You can celebrate that. Most of that was uh, designated for the building, as it should be, and, 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 uh, and all. But here's the cool part. That was given to us out of the estate of a man who did not attend Calvary. In other words, God used somebody who didn't believe in our mission and in our um, uh, vision to bless us in accomplishing the mission and the vision. And, and that's just like God to surprise us in those ways. And, and he just, uh, he's somebody who blessed the community in his estate, and he chose to bless us as part of that. He had some friends that were part of Calvary, and, and they were telling him the things that we're doing, and he wanted to be a part of that. And, and he left a legacy that way. And here's how God's kind of spoke to me. I kind of thought, well, golly, if he used somebody who didn't believe in our mission and our vision to bless us that way, what could he do through those of us who believe in the mission and vision of Calvary? And, uh, and so here's the, here's the challenge. And, you know, I'm assuming that most of you have estate plans, but I know statistically that's not true. So uh, whether you have one or not, I'm going to encourage you to think about making a, a will, you know, doing a trust, doing whatever it is, um, because uh, that's something that all of us should do. I mean, we spend a lot, as I know, some of you are like, ooh, the preacher's talking about death. Hey, guys, it's biblical. You know, the Bible says it's appointed in a man once to die and then judgment. And we spend a lot of time talking about getting ready for judgment, you know. So we talk about grace and mercy and forgiveness because we want you to be ready for that day spiritually. But guess what? We also want you to be ready for that day financially so that you can bless your family and take care of them. And if God leads you so that you can bless the kingdom of God by supporting a ministry that you believe in. So, uh, you know, I felt convicted, and, I, and so this week I went to a lawyer and started the process of updating my will uh, because I was already uh, had it where I was going to bless Calvary, but I wanted to increase those blessings because God has increased his blessings to me. And, uh, and so I just want to challenge you with that. And, uh, and by the way, if you have a family, maybe some of you are going like, hey, we're just a young family, we don't have any assets, but here's the deal. If God has given you children that live at home, you need to have a will more than anyone else because your kids are the greatest possession that God will ever give you. And if, God forbid, something were to happen to you, you need to be directive about who you want to raise your kids. I'm just being honest with you. And while I'm ranting about this, I'll just say this too. If, if you've got kids at home, if you love your family, uh, get some life insurance to take care of them if you're not there. It's so simple, and, and if you love them, do it. I know you don't have the money, and all, you can justify it all the ways you want, but it, it's so important. So think about those things, uh, because God really challenged me about those things. As he blessed us, he also challenged us. Um, so let me change the subject. What is it that drives you nuts, besides preachers talking about money, Okay. Uh, what is it that really is a pet peeve in your life? Something that gets under your skin? Something that you're, you know, just easily distracted by? I want you to take 10 seconds, find someone near you, and I want you to share one, not a list, but one pet peeve. Ready, set, go. People are just like sitting there staring. Now they're starting to talk. You guys aren't, you, this must be the non-annoyed crowd. That's all I'm saying. Or is it too early in the morning for you guys to be awake to have, think about the things that drive you nuts. All right, you've had your time. You can finish the conversation over lunch, because I know some of you won't hear a thing I say the rest of the day. You'll just be thinking about the things that drive you nuts. It, it's, a, it's amazing how simple it is to really answer that question. We, we've all got things that annoy us. For me, it's people driving slow in the fast lane, okay? It's just my simple annoyance. Uh, but if you shorten the question, 
it becomes much more difficult to answer. What is it that drives you? What drives you? What, what's the motivation for your life? What's, what is it that is the basis for your decisions, your direction in life, your values? Do you follow the crowd? I mean, some of you are like, no, I'm a rebel, man. I don't follow the crowd. Or really, do you follow a crowd that's different just like you're different? You see, do you, do you do the things because everyone else in your world is doing it, saying it's important, it's cool, it's smart, it's popular, it's the rage, it's in? I want you to know uh, from this passage we're going to look at, if you go with the crowd, you'll never get anywhere. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 42. Uh, and I just got to tell you, this is a very short passage we're looking at. It's one that I never really paid much attention to because I thought it was just kind of a transitional, moving Jesus from point A to point B. But listen to these words because there's a lesson for every one of us in here. And when it was day, Jesus departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. The people wanted Jesus to stay, but his mission was to go. The people wanted Jesus to stay. Uh, here's the background. Jesus had, had gone out in the desert. He'd prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. The devil tempted him. He went back to his hometown, Nazareth. He preached. They got mad and tried to kill him. And then he went to this town called Capernaum. That was his home base of ministry. And so he's in Capernaum, and he's preaching, and the people love it, and he's healing people, and they're loving it. And he's casting out demons, and they're loving it. And they're like, Jesus, we want you to stay. We love you. You're awesome. You're great. You're a success. You're a hit. And we want you to just be here with us because this is so great. Tell you what, we'll build you the Jesus of Nazareth amphitheater and you can hold services here every night and you can preach and you can teach and you can heal people and you can do demon stuff. It's awesome. We just want you to stay here. People will come from all over here. We want you with us. And Jesus was like, I have to go. I have to go. I mean, we can sit and judge the people of Capernaum and say, oh, well, yeah, they're just being selfish. They want Jesus for themselves. But we'd say the same thing if we were there, right? Jesus, stay. You're the best preacher ever because he is. Jesus, you know, you, you work miracles of healing. None of us have to buy health insurance because if we're sick, we just go to the Jesus crusade. Jesus, this is so awesome. You have power over demons. You're the best security guard that ever existed. See, we'd want Jesus to hang out with us too. But Jesus has a purpose. He has a mission. Hey, guys, i got to go and preach the good news to people who haven't heard it yet. This is my purpose. This is why I came. See, the truth is, you know, we're all kind of selfish. I don't want to offend you, but, you know, it, it's part of our sin nature. And every one of us, myself included, we just gravitate toward being selfish. You know, we want the stuff that we want for us when we want it. And, and, and it's just who we are. And we need to recognize that because we want God to do for us. And God wants us on mission. We want God to do for us. And God wants us on mission. If you're a follower of Jesus... If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that He died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Jesus wants you on mission with Him. He's invited you. He's, he's commissioned you. He's sent you to go and share the good news, the hope of life in Christ with people who haven't heard it yet. That, that's what this passage is all about. And yet we are wrapped up in our needs. We're wrapped up in our struggles, our hurts. And we want Jesus to stay with us and take care of us and provide for us. We want Jesus to heal us. We want Jesus to make our lives wonderful. You know what we want? We want a Jesus genie. That every time things get tough, we can just go and fall on our face and pray and say, Okay, God, I need you to fix this. I need you to make this better so that we want Jesus just to take care of our problems. But Jesus 
wants us to join him in sharing the good news to people who haven't heard it. And this creates the tension. The tension that all of us live in. And I say all of us, I mean all of us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you live in this tension between doing the stuff that you want and the stuff that God wants. And, and, the, and the tension plays out personally like this. It's your pleasure versus God's purpose. This tension in our lives. Uh, here's here's kind of how I, I, I want to summarize it, because I think it, how I know this applies to me. I think it applies to you too. So let's just see if, if I'm right. I want to feel good all the time. I, I just want to feel good, right? And I want to be safe, and I want to be happy, and I want to be healthy while I'm having a good time. Okay, anybody with me on that? Okay, good. Because I have yet to meet somebody who said, you know, I want to feel miserable. I want to be sad and depressed, and I want to be sick and hurting. Uh, and I know some people live their lives that way, but I don't know anybody who actually says they want that. So we want to feel good. We want to be ha happy and healthy and safe and, and have a good time. And Jesus wants us to be faithful. He wants us to, to share the good news, the, the hope we have in Jesus, the fact that we're forgiven of our sins, the fact that we can go to heaven when we die. He wants us to share that. He wants us to love people, all people, whether we feel good or not, whether we're safe or not, whether we're healthy or not. Because if we'll do that, if we'll be faithful, that results in joy and contentment and fruit for his kingdom. But there's this tension. We're living in this tension. I, I hope you can see that in your life because every time you're making a decision, every time you're figuring out the direction for your life, that tension exists and it's pulling us. And we need to be aware of it so that we can address it. And it's not just us as individuals. This, this tension exists for churches too. And in churches it kind of looks like this. It's people-pleasing versus the mission. People-pleasing versus the mission. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, uh, if you've been with us for a while, but since we moved over here to Sweetwater, we've changed some things. Have you guys noticed that? See, at, at Calvary, change is one of our core values. Because we believe it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay where you are. Think about it. It makes sense. You can't stay where you are and Jesus says, let's go over here. Because you're following him. And... and uh, a few years ago, in the midst of uh, changes, because we're always changing stuff at Calvary, uh, my wife, Meralda, said, you know, I kind of preferred it the way that it was before you changed it. And, and this is what pops out of my mouth, so you need to pray for my wife. Uh, I said, um, well, I'm sorry, honey, but we're really not trying to reach middle-aged Christians. <laughs> It's what popped out of my mouth. And uh, so, you know, thankfully, she's a, a person of a lot of grace and a lot of mercy and, and stuff. But the truth is, we're not trying to reach middle-aged Christians. We're trying to reach those who are far from God. Uh, here's a confession. The, I came to Calvary in 1992 as pastor. And for the first decade, our church grew from about 100 people to about 500 people. And everybody was, you know, applauding the success. And look at how God's blessing, and you're doing such a great job as a pastor. And I'll just be honest, I, I, I didn't feel that way. And here's why. Because what we were doing was basically collecting Christians. We weren't leading people to life change. I mean, there were some people who were experiencing a life-changing relationship with Jesus. But by and large, basically people were moving to Lake Havasu City, and they were looking for a church, and we just happened to do church pretty well. And so we just got bigger because we were collecting Christians. And God convicted me, and I felt like, you know, that's not what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to be a church that actually reaches people who are far from God, who need to know Him, who need to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And so we changed everything. And... Uh, some people didn't like it. A lot of people didn't like it. And, and they, uh, uh, they kind of said, hey, can't we stay where we were? Can't we go back to how it was? Can't we just plant right here? And um, I said, no, Jesus wants us to move. Jesus wants us to change. He wants us to focus on reaching the unchurched, on people who need to hear the good news of the kingdom. And so we decided that the mission of Jesus would be what drives our church. And people's preferences, even the pastor's family, would lose to God's mission. 
You see, the mission of Calvary is leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Now, if you've been attending here any length of time, you know that. It's plastered on the wall in front when you walk in. It's the, the mission. We repeat it often, so that's familiar to you. In fact, I was hoping some of you would be, like, you know, mouthing it with me and, and uh, kind of going along with it. But if you're new here, I want you to know that the mission is priority. The mission's priority. Uh, the mission's why we do what we do. So it's why we invest in our children's ministries the way we do. It's why we invest in the student ministries. It's why we care about family ministry. It's why we emphasize quality in worship. It's why we serve our community. And, and honestly, we want to expand the serving of our community. You may not know this. It's why we give over 20% of our budget to mission causes. In other words, for every dollar you give, we give 20 cents of it away. But it's beyond just... Uh, why we do what we do, the mission being a priority is how we do what we do as well. We want to be people who are kind, who are generous, who are joyful. So honestly, I'd rather hang out with somebody who has tons of flaws in their life but is kind to others over somebody who is, you know, holy and looks like their life is all together and just a mean person. I'm just telling you, that's kind of our values here at Calvary because that we, we recognize that God's at work in somebody who's, whose life is a mess but who loves people. And besides, we feel like that's what Jesus did because the Pharisees were the holy, mean people back in his day. And he didn't really hang out with them a whole lot. And when he did, there was conflict. That, that's one of our values because we believe that people don't care about life-changing truth if they don't experience life-giving love. Does that make sense? How about somebody actually tweet that or put that on Facebook instead of karma is crap? Can you guys help me sound intelligent when I preach? It'd be really nice, okay? I get all these quotes out there, you know, other preachers, they all sound, you know, like philosophical and stuff. And Pastor Chad said karma is crap. And I did say it because it's true, but, you know, put something on there. So here it is again for those of you that care. And, and we'd love for you to all to check in on Facebook and stuff like that. People don't care about life-changing truth if they don't experience life-giving love. How we do the mission is important. It's a priority. And the mission is why we go where we go. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said, you... My followers will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Right here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And, and so uh, we are committed, first of all, to reaching the 40,000 plus unchurched people of Lake Havasu City. I mean, all of our programming, most of our resources, you know, over 80% are, are focused on our community. It's priority one. But we're also committed to our region. And so we're planting churches in, in apartment complexes in Havasu and Kingman. And, and we're planting churches on the Wallapai Nation. We're sending stuff and, and showing up on the Wallapai Nation and, and down on the border of Mexico. But we're also committed to reaching our world. And so we have partnerships around the world. We have partnerships in Greece and Albania and Bulgaria and Thailand and soon Mozambique and Africa. And we go to share the good news of Jesus and of the kingdom. And we go to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ who, who oftentimes are a vast minority. And we go because Jesus changes us when we go and serve in his name. He changes our lives. So uh, we're leaving, I'm leaving for Mozambique on September the 1st, about 10 days from now. And I'm going to teach pastors with a couple other uh, uh, Christian leaders, and, and it's going to be a great time. And I told you a couple weeks ago, we're funding a well as a church. Uh, we're going to uh, drill a well and provide uh, a village with water that doesn't have water. It cost $3,000 to do that. We took some of our mission money, and we said, we're going, to, we're going to do a well. And we invited you guys to give and say, hey, if you want to help drill wells for families, uh, for villages, because what happens is they put the well by the church, people come to get water, and they also hear the water of life. And so uh, here's, here's what you guys have done in just a couple of weeks. You have given almost $11,000 towards water wells in Mozambique. And I want to say thank you. Yeah. That is, you guys are awesome. 
You guys really are awesome. And, and here's the deal. We're about $1,100 short of just, you know, of going in and saying, hey, we're going to do five wells for, for these diff five different communities when I'm there. And, uh, and so if God lays it on your heart to help us get to that last $1,100, then great. If not, I'm going to commit to it anyway. Uh, so we're going to be able to do five wells. You see, at Calvary, the mission is priority. It's what drives us. So I have to ask, what's your mission? What's your mission? You see, Jesus knew his mission, his purpose. It directed his life. Go back to, to verse 43 again. But Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. He knew his purpose, and it drove his life, determined his direction, influenced his decisions. So can you identify how you are connected to the mission of Christ? How your life is connected. Now understand, you don't need a formal title or a label or position. Because I talk to people and they go, yeah, I can't really do anything for, for God because I, I don't play guitar and I don't sing and, and I don't preach like the people up there on stage. Now that has nothing to do with it. You can have a huge impact for the kingdom of God. Uh, all of us can, simply by praying for people who are far from God. You have family, you have friends that are far from God that you can pray for. And, and you go, yeah, I pray for them. But do you really? I mean, is it something that's intentional in your life where you say, hey, I'm going to pray for this person, I'm going to pray for these people, and, and get your kids to pray with you for them and say, let's be intentional about this family and about these friends. And, and you can invite people to come, whether they're living here and you're your neighbors, your coworkers, your family, or whether they come and visit you once a year. You go, hey, while you're here, we want to take you to church. We, it, it really means a lot to us, and we want to share that with you. You see, that's mission. And we talk about it all the time, but understand that's a, that's a huge priority. In fact, if all of us are doing that, we don't really need to do a whole lot of other stuff. Because God will be working through you as you make a difference in other people's lives for his kingdom. And, and, and it goes beyond that. Uh, let me just say this. If, if you're really sitting here wondering, what is my mission? And you are married. Your first calling from God is to be a godly husband or a godly wife. In fact, I don't want you to come down here saying, hey, I want to volunteer and help out the church a whole bunch if you're just a terrible spouse. You need to focus on the first calling. God invented family before he invented church. And you need to love your family. You need to love your husband. Love your wife as Christ calls you to. That means being patient and kind and caring and forgiving and, and doing that. And so, you know, that's, that's a calling that God has given every one of us who follows him. If you've got kids at home, part of your mission is to be a godly parent, to point your sons and daughters toward Jesus, to influence them toward the kingdom. If you're a grandparent and, and you're like, well, I don't have that direct influence, you're still influential, whether it's occasionally or all the time, you can point them to Jesus. You can be the one who sends them to camp, who says, hey, I'll write the check right now. Who, you can be the one who says, hey, you want to go on a mission trip? I'll help you get there. Heck, I'll take you with me. You see, those are the kinds of things that, that are missional in our lives, but you've got to think about them. You've got to say, this is my mission, and I take it, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to let it drive my life. You want to go beyond that? You want, to, you want to serve in a formal way, an official way? Great. we got a whole ministry here at Calvary called Serve. And, and the purpose of that is twofold. Number one, it's to help you find your way of serving God. And number two, it's to help us as a church connect with our community in serving. And, and, uh, and you're like, oh, that sounds cool. Great. We have a class called the Equip class, and, and we're offering it next week, next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. You can come take the Equip class, come to worship, and, and it'll be awesome. You can sign up for it online. You can sign up by calling the church office. We would love for you to do that because that class will help you figure out how God has wired you for you to serve him. That's the purpose. So serve. Serve at Calvary. Help us fulfill the mission uh, with all the people that God's sending us. Serve in the community. By the way, if you're volunteering in a community organization and you love Jesus, then you're already on mission because you represent Christ and you represent Calvary when you're there. 
And you can make a difference simply by caring for the people around you as you're doing that. If you have a business in town, you work professionally in town, then that is your mission to go and represent Christ and Calvary in that place. To run your business in a way that honors God. That's part of your mission. So, what is your mission? We really want you to figure that out because if you want to stay close to Jesus, you have to be on mission with Jesus. Now think about it. Let's go back to the story again. The people in Capernaum said, Jesus, we want you to stay here. Stay with us. And what did Jesus say? No, I'm going. i got to proclaim the good news to other people. So if they wanted to stay close to Jesus, what did they need to do? Follow Jesus. They had to be on mission with Jesus if they want to stay close to him. And, and, and I share that because some of you, this may be the missing piece for your spiritual life. Some of you are like, yeah, my spiritual life's kind of flat. It's kind of stuck. Maybe it feels stagnant. And, uh, and you know, and you're reading the Bible and, and you're praying and maybe you're in a life group and, and yet it still seems like there's something else that needs to happen. Maybe it's joining Jesus on mission. Maybe it's being aware that God has called you to mission and you taking that mission seriously. You making it something that you think about and prioritize, even though you might not change a single thing about what you're doing, but suddenly you're doing it with purpose because this is the mission that God's called you to. You see, we know Jesus' mission. Ultimately, it was to pay the price for our sins so that we, by faith, could become sons and daughters of God in Jesus Christ. He suffered and died on the cross as a sacrifice in our place, and today we're going to celebrate his death and resurrection. And we're going to invite you to join with us in celebrating his death and resurrection. And as you do, as we celebrate communion, I'm going to challenge you at this point. Of course, I want you to thank God for the sacrifice for your sins, but I also want you just to simply go, God... What's my mission? Because I'm willing to serve you because you served me.